We are going to begin in about 20 seconds with lessons from Silicon Valley, the main insights and takeaways from today. All right, I would like to start introducing the final panelists. You have met most of them, so I'd like to bring up those who have presented so far. First, I would like to introduce Mr. Roger King, who is up on the first panel. Roger, you want to come on up? Give him a big warm welcome. All right. I'd like to introduce our second panelist member, Sam Wong. You've got to know him really well. Give him a warm welcome. All right, Sam. And I would also like to reintroduce Mr. Sean Flynn. Would you like to come on up? Give him a warm welcome. I would also like to introduce Mr. Jason Yin. He is the managing director of Lamarca, uh, for the Lamarca firm, and also a franchisee owner of four Baskin Robbins. Jason, you want to come on up, take the panel? Now I would like to also reintroduce to you Mr. Darren Herman. Come on up. Are you going to join this one? We're going to have you join. Yeah, well, well, we'll figure it out. I think this one, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to be a little more interactive here. So, um, but Brian Sparks, everyone here. So, Brian Sparks is the Bay Angels Head of Communication and a t the top executive communication coach in Silicon Valley. And he's passionate about building communities to sustain your business. So, um, this will be fun. I think also this one, we do not have to wait till the end for Q&A. We can kind of just jump right in it. So if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll rock and roll. But I do want to, I want to start off by saying a, a huge thank you to everyone who flew in for this event. Most of these people, everyone up here is from Silicon Valley. They flew, flew in. Same with Sean over, over here. A little quick round of applause for everyone. Yeah. Okay. So th th this panel is about the key lessons from Silicon Valley. Uh, Reed Hoffman said that Silicon Valley is a mindset, not a location. Uh, and Xavier Neal stated that the real force of Silicon Valley is the mentality, the spirit. There's no reason at all that it can't be replicated in Paris. So let's throw this uh, first question to Sam, who's done five different startups. If you were starting a venture-backed startup and you lived here in Austin, would you move to Silicon Valley or are there advantages of not being there? Sure. Um, Silicon Valley certainly has a lot of opportunities. There's uh, lots of people that you can meet. For me, uh, again, because we have a little bit of the you know careful versus break things fast, et cetera, um, before I do something as big as a move, I would at least try to get some traction, okay? So um, uh, build what you can where you are at. Don't just move uh, for, you know, unspecified nebulous reasons. Now, if you get into uh, a Silicon Valley you know, accelerator, if you get accepted Y Combinator, maybe you'll move for six months, et cetera. But I think you can do a lot with where you're at. Um, it's probably a case-by-case -case situation. Um, you, I think it's very possible to replicate success outside of Silicon Valley. And, and Brian, talk to me about the importance of communication and building your skills as a leader. So the top of mind response to that is you could have a, if you consider the product or service that you're putting together, you could have a 10 out of a 10. And you can only communicate that at a four or five. At what level are you going to be perceived? The lower level, you're going to be perceived. And so it was said on the last panel how important trust is. And so whether you're seeking funding or you're building a team or trying to grab market share, the way that you communicate that is key. And it is grossly overlooked. It's, the, I believe, the, one of the biggest pain points of all startup founders. And so you've got to communicate trust. You've got to develop a connection with multiple audiences. And uh, Roger, what about um, the, I mean, we might have covered this already in the first one, but I think it's an important question about the current climate of fundraising. And feel free to anybody else jump in on these two, but I do like to kind of throw it to one person to start. Sure. <clears throat> well. COVID has changed everything, as I said earlier. So in terms of starting a company, uh, I, I don't think you do need to move to Silicon Valley. I think you need to keep your costs down, hire people where you are. You do need to spend time in Silicon Valley to raise money. But, you know, the, like I said, the benefit of COVID is we've got this new work from home theory, and it seems to be working out uh, pretty well. 
uh, <clears throat> I've owned a recruiting company for 30 years, and finding engineers in my business is, has been much harder than it is to find executives. And the reason is, you know, companies are shaped like a pyramid. There's only so many executives at the top of the pyramid. <clears throat> Pardon me. Therefore, there's only so many openings. But in the middle of the company, at the individual contributor level, you've got teams of engineers. So if I'm an engineer, I can go to this company, this company, that company. Well, all of a sudden, this has changed because we've got 25,000 engineers just got laid off in Silicon Valley from about four different companies. And it reminds me of the days in the 2020 or 2001 when engineers were working at Starbucks because nobody was hiring. They were all laying off. So it's a great time to hire engineers because you can find them. It's a great time to work remotely because your costs are down. Uh, it's not a great time to put new money into the stock market, and angel investors are looking for alternatives, and obviously startup companies is another one. I think you're going to find the valuations are going to come down. You're going to be mo much more realistic. There's going to be a lot of comp competition for money, but there's always competition for money. But you know, the tall ponies stand up and, and will get funded if you work hard. And uh, Roger mentioned something about COVID. Jason, you, you know, you, you own uh, four Baskin Robbins, and how has COVID affected your business? Has it been, and has it rebounded? Has things changed? Or any insights into more of the, because a lot of these conversations probably get more around SaaS companies, but actually having brick and mortar with employees that you're interacting with? Yes, uh, definitely within um, employment terms, um, it is difficult, but in terms of uh, as a business, um, it actually um, did kind of accelerate it a little bit, uh, where we do have a lot more people coming back out, really excited, um, you know, bringing back into the economy. Um, so it, it really, it depends on where you're located and where are those, that's why it was st strategically um, set in place and where we, um, you know, got those Baskin Robbins. Um, like one downtown San Mateo is always people coming and going. So it's always very uh, strategic. Um, always doing, you know, your like kind of research, doing your homework, finding out not just like, like locations, but even for uh, startup founders, uh, just doing your research of where you got to go, when you got to go, or what are those, you know. And, and has the kind of increase how everybody's kind of gotten online, has that actually affected your guys' business positively or negatively, or has it been about the same? Um, more positively. Uh, before, we never even uh, just keep in mind is, you know, cash flowing uh, business uh, within Baskin Robbins. And uh, even we did not even have a social media output yet. So it's already still flowing. And then with the social media output and going back online and then everybody just coming back out, um, create a bigger, um, you know, opportunity. And this question could be kind of for the entire group or whoever wants to grab it. But um, so, like Austin has become one of these entrepreneurial hotspots, right? And coming from the valley where so many different companies have been created, what value or advantages do you see in creating your startup in one of these hotspots? The cost of employees is much lower, number one, and the cost of uh, their residents is a lot lower. Uh, and you have less traffic than we have in the Silicon Valley, so maybe you're going to have shorter commutes. And, uh, and some people would uh, complain about the traffic and the cost of living here. I think we yeah. could uh, <laughs> you don't, have you different don't, viewpoints. You don't, you don't have traffic here. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, uh, well, let's talk about the e ecosystem in Silicon Valley. I'm sure it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Maybe give we and we all hear about the good here. Maybe give us some of the negatives. So we have everything in Silicon Valley: uh, angel groups, uh, accelerators, uh, venture clusters, all, all kinds of things. But there's a dark side to Silicon Valley. Uh, there are a, a number, and I won't go into them, but there are a number of individuals who put on pitch events. And if you pay the fee, you get the pitch. So there's no due diligence, there's no qualification. Uh, it's, you know, and it's anywhere from 150 bucks to 15,000 with no guarantee that anything will happen. Well, let me tell you, investors like to go to events where the uh, companies have been pre-screened. And if you're just gonna see a bunch of startups that just paid 150 bucks, those kinds of events won't attract real investors. So watch out for that, because there's a lot of people who'll take your money 
and make make promises. I mean, there's one that they do it in a nightclub and they they vote by applauding. You know, I mean, it's just it's just silly. But on the other hand, there's a lot of real uh, places where you can you can network. I mean, we tell the story about just sitting down for coffee in a Starbucks and you meet an attorney, you meet a, a, a angel investor, you meet an engineer, and next thing you know, you're talking about starting up a company. That doesn't happen anywhere else. <clears throat> and I've, I judge uh, events all over the world. In Europe, they don't do that. That's unique to Silicon Valley in, in terms of volunteering your time and sharing and saying, you know, well, you're a good guy, I'll, I'll give you 20 minutes and talk about your thing. Even though if I had no interest in what you're doing, I would just do that because we, you know, we're good people. That doesn't happen in other places. That's really unique to, to Silicon Valley. Yeah, um, and I would echo what uh, Roger just mentioned here, is that uh, there are, okay, Brett Fox is another CEO coach. I respect a lot of what he's done and what he's written. He actually wrote in one of his posts that there are three types of venture capitalists. Really great, 20%. Good to good enough, 60% really, really bad, 20%. Your job as a founder is to avoid the really, really bad ones, okay? How do you know uh, where there's a really, really bad one? We talked about doing the due diligence and you know, uh, searching for uh, investor investments that that VC made that may not, that person may not be proud of, okay? The other thing to consider here is um, even if the, the guys who are you know, right there in the middle and they're trying to take a pitch meeting with you, to determine how much time to spend with them, a lot of VCs constantly have to be in the game. They constantly have to hear pitches because they, you, you might find somebody who is a diamond in the rough, okay, great. But how do you know if someone's really wasting your time? One key question to ask is, when was the last time you wrote a check and how much was it? Whether it's a VC or an angel, okay. If word gets out at a certain VC is not writing checks, then you know they're going to lose the deal flow. People are not going to come to them. So they constantly have to appear as if they are writing checks. So ask them, when was the last time you wrote a check? How much it was? Oh, the other thing is about the, the other thing about the advisors. Um, they're one of the biggest sources of debt equity on a cap table is underperforming or non-performing advisors. People like me. Okay, you have to watch out for people who do the job that I do. A lot of people show up at these events and just with bluster and bloviating make it sound like they do a lot of stuff. Okay, and you get them on the cap table and they don't really do much at all. Of the startups I've been at uh, where I've gone into advice, I'd say roughly about one third to one half of the advisors are dead equity. Thankfully, most advisors don't have a huge chunk of stock, therefore, it's not a huge black mark, but you don't want to waste your time with guys like that. Find somebody, do your due diligence on the advisor as well. And Brian, what are some of the mistakes that entrepreneurs have when they're pitching investors? So, so two things. One, they don't know their audience. Uh, one thing that I help uh, the, the founders that I work with uh, communicate is the connection triangle. And what they'll do is they think that this is an opportunity just to dump a bunch of information. Now, you are all right now troopers because I'm sure you're all feeling it the, that the comprehension level of everything that's been said today is kind of like, wow, this is a lot. This is, is a lot. And the same thing applies when you're giving a presentation. You have to understand that there is, there's engagement and there's comprehension. What is your audience going to take away? Are you also communicating passion and expertise, not on an expertise level that here's everything I know and you are going to all remember it? No, expertise is really can you chunk it down to a very, I think you said it earlier about, or Sean, or one of you said it earlier about, can you chunk it down to an eighth grade level? And then the other piece is, is they miss the empathy. The empathy piece is missing a majority of the time because they're not, they don't know how to connect with their audience and their market. You start looking through their, their pitch deck and they don't have, even have the right market fit on top of that. So then what also has been uh, discussed today is relatability. Can you tell a story to that audience that they can connect with? And so you have a head-heart connection, and in Silicon Valley, you have a ton of smart people. You have a ton of smart people in this room, but the intellectual capacity only needs to go so high. You don't need to be the unicorn. You don't need to be the best, but can you communicate it the best and develop that trust that develops a relationship to sustain you throughout the, the life cycle of your business? 
there was a few things there. But. I'd like to add something to that. S sometimes the founder is not the best person to pitch at, a, at an event. If English is the second language, or maybe you're an engineer and you're just you're just not a good speaker, maybe you're head of sales, or or maybe one of your investors would be a good uh, person to pitch for it. So keep that in mind. The founder doesn't necessarily have to do the pitching. They have to be there to answer questions. But if they're not good at speaking and and they can't, you know, visualize their idea and get it across, you know, find somebody else. Jason, what's what's some uh, so. You, You've been with Bay Angels, correct? And uh, so, what's some advantages of being a part of a, a group or organization like that, and, and looking for those? Because in Austin, we do have some similar stuff—not the exact same thing, but um, you know, I don't know. Anything you want to go with that? Anything you want to speak to that? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, well, just like what everybody's been saying, um, looking at your audience and doing your homework, right? So, uh, being with the Bay Angels, we can actually, you know. Every, I suggest everybody to look at where in their area um, incubators, uh, accelerators, uh, where are some of the angel groups, where are some of the uh, events that are coming on. Um, very important to kind of figure out uh, are you getting any kind of ROI in that event uh, that you're going to be participating in? Are there any investors? Um, some events where just have all founders and no investors in there. And then it's great to begin in the beginning so you can kind of talk to different founders and, and, and get a lot more information and then um, start to see what other founders have done wrong, where to have other founders have done right, so you can kind of bypass that and do what is right. And then, then later on kind of figure out where you can go, where those events you can go to, uh, even Bay Angel events, where there are in investors and then um, where you can pitch or where you can uh, learn more and get more information from that. A follow up on that for you or whomever. Um, how do you? How does one get in? Get into the best incubators or accelerators? Like as a founder. Um, one thing that I've seen is uh, again doing your homework um, and networking. Uh, once you do your homework and you go into um, you know networking and who is well, a lot of people talk about like YC. A lot of talk people yeah. talk about different like top you know. Um, incubators or accelerators, making sure that they actually understand where your industry, what your startup is going through. And then once you understand that, right, and then you figure out who is it that you can connect with. And then once you figure that out, where are there, I'm not trying to be, you know, don't stalk them or anything like that, right? But, you know, trying to figure out uh, what event is coming up within their network where they might be there. So then that will bring you an ROI that when you go to that event, you can connect with that um, person or within that accelerator. And then, you know, I, I think that um, even in the audience, I think when has accelerator, um, you could, you know, just connect with them and then start from there. I think this for the entire group, because we've covered so much today, kind of how to get your fun your business funded, how to scale it, how to exit it. Oh, oh, we got a question from the audience. Quick question for those people on the panel. I mean, I'm really curious about this whole Silicon Valley thing. Are there any any stories that you could share of maybe making a, a bad investment in a group or maybe you got your money taken or, or any uh, any stories you could share that you know only you could tell? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> you got you got the shirt. What, what can I say? All right, two stories. Um, there are some good investors and there are some bad investors. There are some great entrepreneurs and there are some crooks. I got taken in by uh, a guy who was really good at what he was doing and I helped him raise money. I brought investors into it. Um, it was about uh, a company that was sell, uh, a, he, he said his daughter had sold lemonade every day for a full year. And, it, and he got a lot of press because of that. And the uh, Wall Street Journal picked it up. And <clears throat> he raised $100,000 to, to free slaves. Well, it turned out that his daughter didn't sell any ice cream. She went down to the end of the gr uh, driveway every day. They took a picture of the lemonade stand. They put it away and it went. So it was a huge scam. The $100,000 he raised went into his pocket. A, a real free the slaves group in San Francisco found out about it and threatened to sue him unless he refunded that hundred thousand dollars. 
I helped him raise about six fifty, seven hundred thousand. He took a hundred of that and made a donation to the real group to get him out of trouble. So the whole thing was a scam. Well, fast forward ten years, he's doing the same thing, planting trees in Africa. <coughs> Not a single tree will come up and the money is going into his pocket. So it, it sounded like a really good thing and it touched my heart. It really did touch my heart because I wanted to free these slaves in Tibet that were carrying rocks around. So the, you know, as experienced as I am, I lost money on it. I lost credibility on it, the investors I brought in. And then <clears throat> there was another one that I got involved in which was uh, kind of a Bitcoin pump and dump scam. And I lost about $200,000 on that. So I don't have an MBA, but let me tell you, I've spent a lot of money getting educated to get to, to where I, I am at this point. I think one of the things I would say is uh, I agreed to be uh, a fractional uh, executive for this one particular startup. Uh, I thought I had spent a good amount of time doing due diligence and uh, on, on the company because I spend a lot of time. When I uh, do this, I spend you know, 100, 120 hours a month, all right? Uh, so it was a good amount of time. After about 40 hours of working with this particular founder, it turns out that this person argued every little piece of advice. I'm not all-knowing, I understand. I'm not right all the time. But why do you have me here if you're just gonna argue with everything I say? And uh, the, the sad thing was, was that um, as time went on, uh, this person ended up, um, everything that this person claimed about potential people who were interested, as I dug deeper, no one was interested. She misread the entire room, the audience, etc. And my uh, comment is, make sure if you're going to work with somebody that you're coachable. No advice, any quality advisor who, uh, you know, really knows their stuff, if you're not coachable, they will leave and I left, okay? Uh, so I, I, my encouragement to you is make sure uh, you find the right advisor and then listen to them, or at least consider. You don't have to do everything they say. They're not always right, I'm not always right, but have a good reason why you don't do what they tell you to do if you think it's not right. So this will be my last question, then we can open up to the audience, is just uh, as we covered a lot of pieces of information today, what's kind of some golden piece of information that we'd like to leave everybody with and if we can do the, the whole group? Ryan, you wanna start? Let's see, uh, the, the one I would start with is, I think great leadership is not only smart, you, you gotta bring that to the table, you have to be smart, you have to understand how the pieces move. Like, I, I love chess. I could teach the game to you, but someone's gonna win at the end of the day. We all know the same pieces, how they move, there's a limitation on it, when to move it, there's strategy. And so as a leader, it, number one, you gotta be smart, but the other piece that's often overlooked is the EQ piece, the emotional intelligence piece. It's okay to go into a boardroom and have a conversation that says, hey, I'm not clear on how to do this. I'm not clear on the next move here. It's okay to say, you know, this is where my weaknesses are and these are where my strengths are, and I'm gonna hire according to those weaknesses and have those conversations with your investors and your board. I think that's the number one thing is, is know your strengths, and also that with that EQ piece is the ability to integrate into different markets, integrate with your market strategy, bring your team together, and put the pieces together from a emotional standpoint, not just like what I think it should be. A growth mindset will really follow that approach. I think that would be my take. I got more and I got stories, but we're limited on time, but yeah. go ahead. I, I would say um, the best lesson I could leave you with is make sure you invest in learning. Okay. If you look across all the early stage investors and you ask them, what do you look for in, when you're writing a check? 95% of them will say team, 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 team. Okay. It's one of the most common things. Okay. As you're very early stage, you've only got you and another co-founder, or maybe you've got one or two employees and stuff. You can't have a complete team. It's just not realistic with that small of a team size. So you have to do lots of things or someone has to do lots of things that is, are new to them. Your ability to learn is going to be absolutely key until you can find a professional who does that. All right. So invest in time to learn. Um, get a coach. A good coach understands that coaching is product management with you as the product. 
So what I'm going to tell you is probably going to surprise you a little bit. I haven't had a job in 30 years. I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm speaking to a crowd of entrepreneurs. I have two messages. One is so few companies actually make it and get acquired or go public or what have you. Uh, and everybody wants to be a founder and they want to raise money, they want to do this. You know, there, there's nothing wrong as an entrepreneur of having a nice little business. Maybe it's a, 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 a storage locker business or a moving company or a, a dry cleaner. There's nothing wrong with that. So I guess my message is set your priorities and your goals. Make sure they're realistic. And there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong. You're not a failure if you, if you have a small company, you employ a dozen people. That's fantastic. That's how we built this country on small businesses. So, you know, don't think that being a CEO of a public company is your only path to success. I was, he was going to say some uh, team, like what Sam said, but because um, uh, even for Baston Robbins, even for as a VC firm, anything is team, uh, having the right team, having the right uh, people and advisors um, to kind of advise you and go that have went through the hardship and went through, you know, blood, sweat and tears. And then you have to listen to them because they went through all that hardship. And then when you, you know, kind of don't and try to figure out your own way, you will go through that blood, sweat and tears. But on one thing that I would leave besides team is a vision. Um, mostly, mostly, mainly, um, it is very important for me and for a lot of us to uh, know your vision, um, know where you want to go, and then you kind of go through and have different structure procedures uh, to uh, accomplish these goals to hit your vision. And uh, vision is very, very important. A lot of um, startup founders, oh yeah, the benefits and benefits keep on thinking about the benefits, but what is that vision? What is that problem you're trying to solve? You know, uh, that is very, very important. And, and uh, with that, with everybody that had spoke, um, just having that story and having that emotional perspective on it um, actually goes a long way. And with that, let's thank our fourth panel here. Yeah. 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 All right. And I'll just stand. I'll just stand at the corner. All right. So this was the first exit capital plan and summit here in Austin from Silicon Valley. We, we plan to do more, but with that, please tell your networks, please network with, with the group up here. Let us know, give us feedback, talk to your network. And well, you know, next time you see all of us in our F-250s and our LaCruz <laughs> boots. Lucases. Lucases, sorry, Lucases. our Lucases, American alligator. Uh, <laughs> all right. Hey, Sean looked good at him though. Thank you, thank you. But with that, you know, connect our contact information, reach out to us, and thanks everyone here, and thank Darren, thank Dallas, thanks to the, the panel, thanks to the camera crew. Let's, let's, let's thank them, come on. Thanks Michelle here for all the graphics. All right, thank you Wendy, who's gonna be walking around interviewing people post-event. Please give her a few moments, give her feedback. We're, we're, we're using this to help us out for the next events. So, uh, but I think we'll stay around here and network for a bit, too. so yeah. Yeah. Great. All right, stand up. All right, thanks, All right. everyone. Woo.